Thank you very much. Um, that was a fascinating talk. There's masses and masses to talk more about in the, the way that they're working with Allianz. Um, my name is Liam Maxwell. I'm the National Technology Advisor for the British Government. I was the CTO, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about what we did um, to change and how we used culture of uh, openness to change what we were doing. Um, I've talked to lots of things where you go to conferences and you meet these startups, and we were given this task of creating a startup in government, as it were, and I end up saying that I'm a member of a, a tax collection and public service delivery startup. We're in our 400th round of funding. Um, <laughs> sort of finding it difficult to deal with agile as a concept because so much of our life has been structured. Um, and I do recall going with uh, my colleague, then Mike Bracken. We went to an agency of government. And government is great at creating these neologisms where they say, you know, everything should be agile. Um, and I remember going there, and they, they had a presentation. They really wanted to please us, and they talked about agilution. Because um, they wanted to do agile, but not that fast. So it was a sort of agile and evolution together. And, you know, bless them, they got there, actually. But it was one of those things where culture and, and where the culture of change makes a difference. And so let's talk a little bit about the challenge that we had to, in order to face our, our change at that point. And the challenge that we faced was this. We were spending too much money, okay? So we were spending about 1% of the British economy on technology within government. And that's... Although you hear about funding, it's amazing how much you can do with that and not get it right. And so the, uh, we had the initial set of change controls which we brought in. And obviously this was contentious, but it meant that we could get change moving by using a form of control. And we had a very, very strong focus on what we wanted to do. We wanted to move away from paying large amounts of money, but we wanted to move away from having a system that didn't work. Okay? We were Olympic grade at having services that didn't work for our users, and so one of the core things we started to define was we would design services that were based around user need. And it's very rare to find a politician to stand up and say, we will build services around our users, but that was the core running principle of what we were doing. We're there to build a digital government, and that's a government based around user need. And we needed models. We needed new models. One of the things we were hearing about Allianz and um, their change was that they needed to move fast. You need to bring in the change of moving faster. And the thing we found very quickly was that technology was moving much faster than we as a government could move. So you've got to change your game. It was actually starting to render us irrelevant because if we didn't change to help provide services for our citizens, then our citizens would go and use other things. It's rather like when you run the IT in an organization. If you don't provide the services that people want to use, they use shadow IT. You find people using Gmail or Hotmail to go and do their work. It's the same thing. If you don't move in that way, it won't work for you. And also, you need to move away. This cycle we had was move away and focus on your innovation on things that are new and things that need to move and stop trying to innovate all the time with things which are common. You see, we had designed ourselves in a particular shape where we kept on reinventing ourselves. We kept on reinventing the common components that we needed to make work. And also, because we worked in a commercial and a government construct where we had interpreted the rules in a particular way, we had done this. We had actually managed to lock all of that inside a black box procurement structure. We tried to procure our way out of trouble, and this wasn't going to work. And we came to realize that culturally we were facing what we called the square of despair. Okay? So all of these things were reasons why you shouldn't do things. I've often talked about there being a department of no. Okay? And we work in the Department of Work Pensions, Department of Health, Department of Tax. There's a department of no. And part of it was, the, was these things, these four things. Every time you wanted to change something, people said, oh, but the legacy. Every time that you wanted to change something, you couldn't find the right people because we had spent 25 years outsourcing great people out of the civil service. So we had to get people back in. We recruited almost immediately 200 great new people into the civil service at leadership positions. 
we always found that security was cited as a problem. So people would go, well, I can't do that because of security. Cloud computing and the ability to put your data into a safe cloud space is something that civil servants found culturally very difficult at the time. But over four years, we've moved. I use Gmail for my email, for the cabinet office email, for my department email. Now, that was something which people couldn't understand. How could you possibly do that? But strangely, you find that organizations that run cloud services are actually quite good at security. And as so long as you make sure you check with them and you make sure you're up to date, it's just as safe. In fact, many people would say it's just, it's more secure. And also procurement. We'd invented a whole series of rules which meant that it cost too much money to sell to the government. And therefore, if you were a small business or an innovative business, why would you bet all of your funding to spend it on filling in procurement forms. We were cutting ourselves out from the market. And so technology is moving faster than we were. We had to be free to keep up. We had to change our shape. So we did this. The whole of government is built like this. It's actually constitutionally built like this. You have departments. Everyone is responsible in those departments. And yet we had to move to a concept of platforms because there were common things that we were all doing. Now, we've been doing it for years with electricity. You know, we didn't go and have a departmental generator to build our electricity in, but we had to do this with tech as well. We had to move to a platform-based approach. And conceptually, that's very difficult, because the thing that means is that the member of one department is going to rely on the member of another department to help them. And culturally, that's massively difficult. You'll find that within companies. You'll find that within all organizations. But it's one of the competing things. It's one of the great changes that has happened is we're able now to help people trust across government. So we brought in a set of changes. There's the mechanics of that. So we agreed a code of practice. We agreed design principles because the design of our services was right at the core of making them successful. If we designed them for officials to use, they wouldn't work. Famously, infamously, a particular program, I remember starting looking at the first cut of this huge waterfall project development which said, developed a piece of software. I had a look at the first release of it, and it said, question five, are you pregnant? Question nine, are you a woman? <laughs> we, we had sort of failed to do things. I was famously involved in a, in a program for farming subsidies. And when I got there on the first day, it said, are you a young farmer? Question 10. Question 38, what is your date of birth? These two things could have been done better. We kept on asking questions we didn't need to ask. The most famous one for me always being, do you have a valid driving license? Now, the efficient way of answering that is yes or no. It isn't give me the license number and where it was issued, because you just need to know, is it yes or no? We can do much better. We also committed to openness. So one of the famous things we did was the open document format that we made sure that within the UK and within government, we always recognize we will be able to share documents using open standards. We cut out a lot of friction. That was the organization chart I inherited. I'll leave that for you to think for a moment. That was the organization chart I inherited. Can you imagine having to try and get a contentious policy through that? And that's what we did. We cut it out. We decided we'd say, look, we would focus on four main areas. Shared services, ERP, digital services, mission IT. Those are the things that only those departments can do. And then huge boatload of common technology services, all the things that we do common across government. Build that once. And we expanded the marketplace for our suppliers. So on the left, that was our supplier base of direct line of supply, 85% of that huge number of spending was done by 12 companies. We had to expand. So we grew our marketplace. We opened up our market. We made it easier to sell into government. We made it easy so that small businesses could deliver innovative solutions to government. And we made sure that we scaled that. And now the digital marketplace is about a billion pounds a year. 52% of that is small, medium enterprises. So the whole point of that was so we could get an innovative supply chain. And we are now a center of digital excellence in government. The OECD have recognized that we were, we were the first place within the OECD in, in that. So we changed how we treated our technology. Remember this transition curve? We decided to go for that. Okay, We can move and do common things together. 
And the way that we did that change was we made things open. This was one of the slogans we used right at the very beginning. Make them open, then make it better. Open was our main tool of disruption. And it's fundamental to everything that we've done. Everything boils back to four components. You see, if you're going to use the internet, it's a common resource. So if you're going to use a common resource, you need to have standards. So we made sure we had open standards. And we're very, very strong on the fact that our open standards go through a huge peer review process with the community to make sure that they are truly open for us. That then meant that we could use open source effectively. And believe me, introducing open source into government has been an interesting lie, an interesting period. Because the opposition to it was absolutely fundamental to people who work in a risk-based environment where they see risk as a binary thing. And the ability to cooperate was, wasn't there. But we introduced open because it made things better. We looked a lot, sorry, I'll just go back. Open markets meant that we could open up to everybody so that we could have diverse markets, so we could get the right innovation, so that we could buy from the people that had the best ideas, not the people that were best at filling in forms. It's as basic as that. And then also open data. You will know that we were the first transparent government. We, were the, we are the most transparent government on the, in the world in terms of how much data we publish around what we do. And we were very, very, key, uh, very, very keen to make sure that we were open about our spending and how we got to where we got to. But now we are very open in how we will interpret our policy. And you'll see that our new prime minister is now looking at using, setting our policy, and then using open data to make sure that those policies are implemented, particularly around things like the disparities in how you're treated by our system if, um, according to race. That's one of the core components of our approach. So it's at the heart of the approach the government is taking. It's also at the heart of the approach that other governments are taking. So there are four governments here. I don't know if you can spot which ones they are. Top left is probably quite easy. So that was the uh, beta for gov.il. On the top right, that's New Zealand. The bottom left, if any of you from Estonia will know, that's a glorious X-Road from Estonia, which is an open source approach to government. And in the bottom right, President Park Geun-hye of Korea. We five governments actually work together very closely. You may notice that the top two um, components there look relatively similar. They look quite similar to gov.uk. There's a reason why they do that. It's because they're based on gov.uk. They've used the same code. Because governments don't need to complete. Like other world leaders, we want to start and we want to create the same thing. We want to be able to build a government that's based on the internet. Because it's the most effective, it's the fastest way, it's the best way of building the services we need to build, but it's also the way that meets our users' needs most effectively. They don't want to know that they're dealing with the Department of Finance or the Department of Chairs or the Department of Agriculture to get their parking permit, which in some circumstances it could be some of those used. They just want to know that the government is there to work for them. And so that approach of thinking, how do we build a government of the internet is right at the core of what we're doing. So we use open to unlock change, and the dynamic force behind that has been competition. When we decided we wanted to build things for, um, for government quickly, simply, effectively, we made sure that we could use all the right suppliers that were available, not just the ones that had previously been good at winning contracts. We made sure that we used standards, which meant that people could work together so that not everything had to be delivered by one organization, but people could work in teams. Now, what that meant was that our openness and our ability to start delivering drove competition. And actually what that drives if you have true competition in the market, as Sam was saying, it drives the adoption of open source. It also drives a high percentage of small business engagement, which means that you get much more innovation, which means that you're open to ideas, which means that you're not the smartest person in the room, because the smartest people in the room are the people that come in to work with you, to collaborate with you. And of course, it also means that we can start to change our shape. It means that we can start to move to the concept of sharing, because if we have standards and we can share, it then means that we can move from silos, where government is set to build itself, into the use of platforms where we can share components and share what we have built together. 
Let's just have a think about that, what we have built together. Because governments generally don't compete. Now, I've put up here two organizations, OK, on the left-hand side, the DVLA, on the right-hand side, the, Swedish, uh, the Norwegian DVLA. Now, it may come as no surprise to you, but I have and we have no desire to provide services to the Norwegian Drivers Association. We have no desire to issue driving licenses in Norway. Famously, I, or rather infamously, I said that um, we, we, have, we no longer have a wish to collect tax in America. <laughs> um, sort of moved on. <laughs> um, took a long time. But if you think about it, um, we're doing the same thing. I, a driving license, is, you go through the same set of rules. One of the things we discovered as we opened up government and looked at the size of government was that we were doing the same thing so many times within our own government. We were issuing licenses. And in compute terms, issuing a shotgun license and issuing a fishing license aren't actually that different. You give your name, you give your data, you go through a set of business rules, you pay some money, ka-ching, you're done. And so why are we trying to continually reinvent the wheel in a particularly British way? Actually, we should be able to share what we do and share the components of what we do. Because as governments, we don't compete. Not for that. And so we're now starting to work very closely with governments to do this. And the governments that I showed you previously have also done that. That if you're um, working in the tax system in Vietnam, you're probably using some form of Korean code to help you get that moving. If you're working in the health service in Finland, you're going to start finding that the enterprise service bus across your services is the X road. In fact, the, the Finnish government has made the X road more secure, has helped to develop it into a much better service. And so we're actually looking much more at cooperation and collaboration. We have open sourced all of our code. We have open sourced our tooling. We have open sourced our methodology so that you will find that other governments are able to start doing the things where we had the early battles. And you'll see that in local government in the UK, they're adopting standards to help them introduce better services for citizens. If you look at the Australian government and the Digital Transformation Office, they started to take place, use a service standard, which looked very similar to the British service standard. And that's great because it means that we together can actually work more effectively. The biggest problem we have is that we can't find enough great people to come and work in government. And so that's the motto we have. We shouldn't try to do everything ourselves. We can't. That's where we ended up going wrong for many, many years. Cooperation and collaboration is the way forward for us because we can make sure that what we work on is the work for the people. But it also means that we can get the best services. It's a completely different model. We're not looking at spending 16 and a half billion pounds a year on proprietary technology to work in one particular part of the government. We are looking to create services that work for everybody across the whole of our government so that we don't have to continually reinvent the wheel. It's very basic, it's very simple. But that concept and the culture of delivering that is very difficult to win the argument for. But we're getting there. And I suppose the thing that is now galvanizing us is how do we use what we've got to remove the friction from government? All the successful tech businesses, all the successful new digital businesses are about taking away the broker, removing the friction, helping people do things quicker, smoother, simpler for them. That's the aim we have in government as well. It will reduce our cost but it will massively increase our uptake and mean that we deliver the services that our citizens need. And that's how we grow fast. And as I leave you with one thought, we started with these huge monoliths delivering in silos. We now find ourselves with a growth market called GovTech. They're like FinTech, which the UK excels at. We now have, and we built, 500 business cases for companies to get involved with government, to sell to government, to deliver services that we wanted, but built in the right way, where we collaborate, where we share, 
where we can work effectively across platforms and work effectively across departments to deliver the services our citizens need. And the big thing about that is that's a sustainable model. And if you're starting to work and starting to look at a rules-based and starting to look at a service which allows you to work in a rules-based environment where people will want to work together, then government might well be for you. You may have thought for many years not to do it, but you may now find that government is actually a profitable market for you to invest time and effort to come and collaborate with. Thank you.